Good evening. You're watching the news at 7.30 on ATV. I'm Edna Zhe. And I'm Emily Stu. Here's a look at tonight's top stories. Beijing has moved an APEC finance minister's meeting from Hong Kong to the capital. Education official ordered to perform 140 hours of community service for misconduct in public office. Six days of smog in Beijing and northern China trigger fears of pollution crisis. Hong Kong will not be staging a key regional economic conference scheduled for September. Instead, the meeting has been moved to Beijing as part of a full range of events held by the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Group this year. The sudden switch in venue triggered speculation about the reason, but the SAR government says it's logical to hold all APEC events in Beijing. A statement released by the government this afternoon told people that Hong Kong has lost its role as host of the APEC finance minister's meeting. The short announcement came after the SAR government was informed by Beijing about the sudden change of plans. Hong Kong had been scheduled to hold the Asia-Pacific Economic Corporation meeting in mid-September. But the city learned today that the venue has been switched to Beijing and the gathering will take place later in September. Logistical arrangements because of the broad range of issues in the APEC process were cited for the change. The SAR government said it respects the decision by the central authorities and thanked the relevant ministries for their support over the past months. The abrupt switch sparked speculation that it could have been prompted by the recent protests against mainland visitors, who have been blamed for overcrowding shops and tourist facilities here. Executive Councillor Regina Ip refused to draw a link between the protests and the change of venue, saying only that the decision is regrettable. I wouldn't want to speculate on the reason, but I'm sure they've taken into account a basket of factors, including our ability to host um, uh, international, high-level international meetings in an orderly and controversy-free environment. Fellow EXCO member Zhang Yu Tong pointed the finger at the Occupy Central movement, which plans to block the streets of the business district if the government's political reform package falls short of public expectations. Zhang said it is difficult to guess the impact of the civil disobedience group on international events staged in Hong Kong, comparing the situation with Thailand, where anti-government demonstrators have paralyzed large parts of the capital, Bangkok. Democratic Party lawmaker Albert Ho expressed shock with the sudden announcement and found Beijing's explanation hard to believe. Liberal Party lawmaker James Tian said more information is needed to confirm if Hong Kong is not capable of holding a world gathering. But Tian added that Hong Kong is an international financial hub and has good experience in staging big events such as the World Trade Organization conference in 2005. However, Treasury Secretary Chiang Kai-kung dismissed concerns that Beijing is reacting against Hong Kong. He said the finance minister's meeting is part of the entire APEC process. Most of the other events are being held in Beijing, so it's logical to stage all the functions there. Chan added that the switch will not affect Hong Kong's image, saying the city has the capability to stage international events. The hearing has begun in an appeal by the China Chem Charitable Foundation that it be declared the beneficiary and not the trustee of the fast fortune left behind by the late tycoon Nina Wang. And a senior education official has been sentenced to 140 hours of community service for misconduct in public office. ATV's Arthur Erkeola reports. Senior Education Officer Yun Wai Chong left Kowloon City Magistrate's Court after being ordered to perform 140 hours of community service. The development officer at the Education Bureau had been found guilty of misconduct in public office. The court heard that in 2011, 52-year-old Yun arranged for the niece of a friend to be allocated to an English secondary school under her jurisdiction. Yun supervisors said the Bureau did not know about the arrangement. In handing down sentence, the court accepted the defense's recommendation for community service after noting that the defendant who had worked for the government for nearly 30 years did not have a criminal record. Education Secretary Eric Ng said the case has saddened him and that Yun has been suspended. 
but he said it was an isolated incident, adding that Education Bureau staff are professional and follow guidelines. Lawyers for the China Chem Charitable Foundation were at the High Court this morning as proceedings began into the group's bid to be declared the beneficiary of the $83 billion left by late tycoon Nina Wang. Last February, the High Court ruled that the foundation was a trustee of the fortune. Under this arrangement, the Justice Department can intervene if it decides money is being used against Wang's wishes. But China Kim argues that Wang did not state in her will that she wanted a trust fund for her estate. It also believes she wanted her fortune to be used for China Kim's business and for charity. Three days have been set aside for the case. Arthur Akula, ATV News. Constitutional Affairs Chief Raymond Tam said the government will start consulting the public on what should be done if Beijing rejects a chief executive chosen by the people in 2017. His comments came as a new round of debate opened after a mainland think tank said the basic law should be interpreted if Beijing does not accept a leader chosen by universal suffrage. Mainland and Constitutional Affairs Chief Raymond Tam was on familiar ground today when he attended a council meeting in his home district of Yunlong. There was overwhelming support for the government's stance that nominations for chief executive candidates must conform with the basic law and decisions of the National People's Congress. Tam then addressed questions raised after an influential mainland think tank said yesterday that the basic law may have to be interpreted should Beijing reject Hong Kong's next chief executive chosen by universal suffrage in 2017. Li Lin of the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences noted that Hong Kong's mini-constitution does not say what should be done if the central government finds the winning candidate unacceptable. Tam today said this issue will be discussed in the two remaining months of public consultation on political reform. But he doesn't think an interpretation of the basic law will be necessary. The government has been stressing that the nomination committee has the sole authority to name chief executive candidates. And analysts say the chances of the group choosing candidates that Beijing dislikes are very low. Tam was also asked if the government has a backup plan if Lechko rejects its proposals on constitutional changes. The approval of two-thirds of lawmakers is necessary before the reforms can be implemented. Tam said if the blueprint fails to win support in Lechko, the government may have to resort to the election committee. All three chief executives since the handover were chosen by the group, which had 1,200 members in the last election in 2012. But he said Hong Kong people would be gravely disappointed if lawmakers dismiss the government's proposal, adding that it will have a negative impact on the relationship between the legislature and the administration. The city's first public hospital for children will open its doors in Kai Tak in four years' time. And lawmakers from both the Liberal Party and Democratic Party have proposed extending the retirement age of doctors to ease a shortage. Arthur Keola reports. It was a rare sight. Lawmakers from the Liberal and Democratic Party standing side by side. As it turned out, both were on the same page regarding the city's health care. Their joint proposals include increasing the number of doctors in the city by amending registration to attract more overseas specialists and extending the retirement age. They say this would shorten waiting times at public hospitals and help the aging population. The Liberal Party's Vincent Fang said doctors should retire at 65 and not 60 because they have valuable experience. While the two parties don't see eye to eye on a number of issues including constitutional reform, they are convinced that a united front is needed to help improve health services. <laughs> Meanwhile, Chief Secretary Carrie Lam and Health Secretary Ko Ing Mat were at the groundbreaking ceremony for the Center of Excellence in Pediatrics. The $13 billion center is the city's first public pediatric hospital and will begin operation in phases from 2018. The center in Kai Tak will have 468 beds and also house research and training facilities. The hospital will focus on helping children with serious and complex illnesses and the different facilities will be rolled out in phases. These complex cases are uh, lumber in according to their severity. Uh, for example, for the pediatric cancer cases, we allow handling about 200 cases, new cases every year. So these are something that we have solid data. Uh, for some other complex cases, it depends on whether they will be centralized in the uh, children's hospital or still managed in the regional hospital. That's still under the discussion. 
Hospital Authority Chief Executive Lung Pak Yen says he is confident there will be enough staff. And work is currently underway to redistribute pediatric specialists around the city and arrange the necessary special training. Arthur Rakula, ATV News. A man on the mainland has made history by suing the government for failing to stop air pollution. The landmark lawsuit came as the World Health Organization said pollution in northern China should be seen as a crisis. ATV's Esther Chen reports. For the sixth straight day, smog is blanketing Beijing. According to data from the U.S. Embassy, the levels of noxious, tiny particles reached 469 this morning, compared with just over 500 at the weekend. A reading above 300 is considered hazardous. Of course, on days where pollution levels reach or even exceed the scale, we are very concerned and we have to see this as a crisis. A crisis means that we need to take immediate action to protect ourselves. So on these days, of course, we have to recommend that people don't go outside to have physical activities. They stay inside, keep children inside to the extent possible to protect them from the possible negative health effects that we have. An orange pollution alert, the second highest warning is in force, prompting 150 factories in the capital to stop or reduce production. But the measures have done little to assure people. Many complain that pollution has become a daily affair and they're worried about their health. Other parts of northern China are also covered in thick haze. In Hebei province, a man has filed a lawsuit accusing the government of not doing enough to curb air pollution. He's also demanding compensation after spending money on air masks and an air purifier. It's not known whether his legal challenge will be heard in court, but his attempt has highlighted people's growing frustration with what they see as the government's feeble attempts to clean up the air. Esther Chen, ATV News. The U.S. is planning to trim its military in a bid to meet spending caps after two costly wars. But Republicans oppose the cuts, which even if approved, will leave the U.S. with a bigger defense budget than Russia and China combined. Ben Arook reports. There are currently 520,000 men and women serving in the U.S. military. But if the Pentagon gets its way, the number will be cut in the coming years to 440,000. That's the lowest since before the Second World War. The popular A-10 attack jet will be retired, as will the U-2 spy plane, under the proposals to slash the defense budget by about $75 billion over two years. But the expected savings coming after two expensive wars in Iraq and Afghanistan will create other problems. You have fewer troops, fewer ships, fewer planes. Readiness is not the same standard. Of course there's going to be risk. That means there's risk across the whole horizon of responsibilities. Uh, and that's, that's what we're talking about. The answer would be to deploy a smaller but better trained force equipped with state-of-the-art technology. Now we're all willing to take risks, but none of us are willing to take a gamble. The proposals, unveiled well before November's midterm elections, have already been denounced by opposition Republicans, who warned that U.S. military readiness will be affected. Other critics say despite the reductions, the Pentagon's budget of 500 billion US dollars this year is still much more than the military spending of Russia and China combined. Analysts also argue that the US is moving away from strategies involving boots on the ground, preferring instead to use drones that can be controlled from the safety of American soil. Ben O'Rourke, ATV News. For the third straight year, Hong Kong has seen a record rise in new HIV cases. But first in a round of local stories, public satisfaction with the government on the eve of the budget stands at 24%, slightly worse than it was two weeks ago, according to the University of Hong Kong. Both Chief Executive Leung Chen Ying and his administration have become slightly more unpopular over the past two weeks. The University of Hong Kong interviewed more than 1,000 people over the phone last week and found that the support rating for Learn was 46.6 marks, 1.5 marks lower than in the previous poll. The results also showed that those aged between 18 and 29 are most critical of the chief executive. The public satisfaction with Learn's administration was 24 percent, a 2 percent drop from a fortnight earlier. The HKU poll, one of the city's most respected, will also conduct an instant survey tomorrow after Financial Secretary John Zhang unveils the budget to see how the economic blueprint will affect public confidence in the government. 
Lawmakers have accused the administration of dragging its feet over universal retirement protection. Welfare sector lawmaker Peter Jones claimed officials are wasting time by adopting any face of attitude, while unionist lawmaker Leung Yu Chung slammed the government for not giving a time frame on when there will be any kind of retirement protection. The Labor and Welfare Bureau hit back saying the issue is being studied and time is needed for analysis. A report will be submitted to the Commission on Poverty by the middle of the year. The Center for Health Protection has reported a record number of new HIV cases for the third consecutive year. Last year, there were 559 cases, up from 513 in 2012 and 438 in the previous year. Health officials are worried by the trend. Most of the infections were caused by sex, prompting the center to advise that condoms should be used properly. Overseas again, days of reunions between Koreans separated decades ago by the war between the North and South have come to an emotional end. But first, in a roundup of international news, Ukraine has delayed a vote on forming a new government. Benerwick reports. The well-known phrase, if you break it, you pay for it, appears to be the principle behind the US and Europe scramble for cash to help Ukraine, which has been hit by months of anti-government protests. This support can complement an IMF program by helping uh, to make reforms easier and by putting Ukraine in a position to invest more in health and education uh, to help develop Ukraine's human capital and strengthen its social safety net. Once Ukraine signs up for IMF and international aid, membership to Europe will almost certainly be guaranteed, but it will have to introduce austerity measures to repay the loans. With the dismissal of President Viktor Yanukovych, Washington and its allies are calling for a unity government, but the Ukrainian parliament has delayed a vote on forming a new administration until Thursday. There were some emotional scenes in North Korea today as elderly South Koreans said tearful goodbyes to relatives they had not seen since their separation due to the war over 60 years ago. The 88 people in the second group returned to the South today. For many of those making the trip to the resort of Mount Kumgang, it could be the last chance they will see their loved ones. The reunions used to be held every year or so, but have not taken place for three years due to tensions between the two Koreas. Last September, Pyongyang announced it was postponing the reunions indefinitely, and there were fears this round would be scrapped due to the North's anger over the South's military drills with the US. Thousands of pro-government bikers rumbled through Caracas yesterday in a show of support for Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro. Meanwhile, Western-backed anti-government demonstrators put up barricades and set fire to rubbish in other parts of the city. Spokesman for the bikers, Ricardo Vargas, said the difference between the two protests was that they were peaceful and abiding by the law, while the others weren't. Addressing the biker rally, Maduro accused the opposition of bringing in mercenaries to fuel the violent protests. The U.S. has called for talks between the two sides. Another way of putting this is that uh, when President Maduro calls for a dialogue with uh, the U.S. president and an exchange of ambassadors, he should focus instead on a dialogue with the Venezuelan people, uh, because that is what is at issue here. But U.S.-backed opposition leader Enrique Capriles has rejected Maduro's invitation to meet for talks. Ben O'Rourke, ATV News.